What I would like to share with you for a few final moments is a vision of the things that matter most to me. This is the story of how Thatcherism transformed Britain, told by its true believers. She believed that a small band of devoted people with an idea should conduct a march through the institutions of British government and British society to change them. And when you look back on it, she did change one heck of a lot. People suddenly th thought, good heavens, this terrible woman who we thought was going to be temporary is permanent. Uh, we'd better listen to what she's saying. State socialism is not in the character of the British people. It has no place in our traditions. It has no hold on our hearts. It was the dawn of a new era. People began to realize that they were onto something here which was worth fighting for. But Mrs. Thatcher's ideological crusade would divide Britain and even her own party. She had become a complete megalomaniac. And you began to think, oh, Lord, Margaret, give it a rest. And ultimately, she did, booted out by her own friends and allies. If Thatcherism was to endure, it was important that she made the supreme sacrifice. It had all been going so well. In 1983, Margaret Thatcher was re-elected to a second term in office. With a majority of 144 seats in the House, her command over the country was greater than ever before. Up to that point, she had really had to struggle internally with many of her cabinet ministers about the direction that the government was going to take. After 1983, there was no question. She was in charge, and she was a lady in a hurry. I think she felt that she'd been a bit experimental, uh, perhaps on probation before. But now, they voted for her and what she had to offer. Having had a good look at it, they wanted more of the same. To walk in there as part of that uh, crowd, it's like being part of a conquering army. There was a buzz that um, we felt. It was a revolutionary time to, uh, to be living, and you know, just like Wordsworth's poem on, on the French Revolution, it, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive and, and to be young was very heaven. For the new wave of Thatcherites, a golden age had arrived. Their leader was in charge, their opposition in tatters. And the Labour Party was simply in a total mess. It was sort of meltdown time. Their policies looked like a reversion to the 1970s, and nobody wanted that. And indeed, the, the Labour Party's manifesto, um, you may remember, was described as the longest suicide note in history. Um, and it was um, a, 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 an argument that said we must go back to nationalisation, that we must go back to socialism, that we must go back to heavy taxes, we must go back to massive public expenditure, um, and, and was absolutely out of sync with the mood of the British people. So just what did the British people expect from the Conservative Party? In 1983, there was little evidence of the radical change to come. What was curious, of course, was that they win the 1983 election with practically nothing in the manifesto. They win with a blank cheque. In the election, they'd made it clear that there needed to be more reform, but they'd been pretty unspecific in what kind of reforms. <laughs> Thatcherism, I think, began to enter into the language in, in the early 80s. So the only question was, what would Thatcherism be like? And I have to say, in 83, I still think that was something of an unknown quantity. Margaret Thatcher didn't so much have an ideology as a series of instincts. And the instincts were, first, that the state should do less and the individual should do more. Secondly, that the state should spend less so the individual could spend more. And thirdly, that the state should own less so the individual could own more. 
and those are the instincts that guided her right through her 11 years as Prime Minister. In her early days as Prime Minister, Maggie sought ideas from all sorts of surprising places. But I've even seen her stop her car on the street, grab somebody from the pavement, somebody that she recognised, drag them into the back seat and said, tell me what you're thinking, tell me what your thoughts are. And they would all go into her handbag. And that handbag became the repository from which things like um, the Conservative Manifesto uh, eventually came. She'd be a great sponge for people like that. However, for a Prime Minister, curb crawling for ideas could be seen as unseemly. Better to solicit ideas from a chosen coterie indoors. Among them, an Oxford Don, John Redwood. I was uh, made head of the policy unit, so I was then able to help her with her colleagues draft an agenda for government. And we literally had a blank sheet of paper. John Redwood's first task would be to draw up the blueprints for a radical new project. The plans were hatched at the Treasury. Since the war, successive governments had invested heavily in the big nationalised industries. Money. Now it was time to return them to the free market, get them off the government books. A new buzzword entered the national vocabulary, privatisation. Privatisation was something new, something different, something exciting. We were at the beginning of a very important strand of policy which turned out to be really quite revolutionary. Privatisation uh, was one of these very rare occasions when a genuinely new policy uh, was put in place. This was something that had never been done before, not merely in this country, it had never been done anywhere in the world. The plan was so radical that other members of the Conservative Party thought the Thatcherites were dangerous fanatics. When we started putting the idea forward, there were a lot of Conservatives opposed to it. You know, it's a natural monopoly. Um, no one will want to buy the shares. There'll be strikes. Why go into all this agony and trouble? I was looked upon as a lunatic. I, I, I was sort of almost put in a darkened room to sort of relax and be quiet for a bit. Because this was absurd. This was an absolutely absurd thing to do. So absurd that caution nearly killed it. Margaret Thatcher was extremely apprehensive about how it would work out in practice. And I think a number of us had to push her to get ahead with it rather faster than instinctively uh, she wanted to. Of course, privatisation was a bit of an adventure. It had never really been attempted on the scale we were trying to do it. And there was a, if you like, we were entering unknown territory. In the end, Mrs Thatcher was won over by simple arithmetic. The national debt was £128 billion, a good proportion run up by state-run industries. You would think running a monopoly of all the gas, all the electricity, all the phone calls uh, would be a licence to print money. Uh, but it didn't prove to be that in state-run hands. The nationalised industries overall lost several billions in total each year. For John Redwood, privatisation was an ideological crusade. For others, it was about hard cash. The motivation for privatisation uh, was very practical, actually. The Treasury loved it. Nigel Lawson said, goody, goody, lots of money coming in. And there was huge sums of money came in to the Treasury. So they were very enthusiastic. So when the Treasury is behind it, uh, you know, they always said, if it moves, sell it. People thought that we were just trying to flog off the state assets in order to get some money. It wasn't that at all. What it was was that the nationalised industries were profoundly inefficient. Hey, listen to this. The first company put up for sale was British Telecom. Ah, oh, isn't that lovely? British Telecom was beset by problems. 
its technology hopelessly out of date. Modernization would cost the country two billion pounds. No government could spend that kind of taxpayers' money. We were living in a world where there was one supplier of telephones who came and gave you a telephone if he felt like it. You might wait six weeks for a new telephone. You wanted to start a business, you couldn't actually start the business because you couldn't get a telephone line. Yes, that'll make it. A year and a half we've been waiting now for a telephone. Oh, I'm absolutely fed up with waiting. I really am. I worked in the city and I remember I couldn't get a line from the stock exchange to my office, which was about four minutes walk away, that didn't degrade uh, when it was raining. And so every time it was raining, I couldn't see all the data on my screen because the rain had got into the, into the cable. It was like a, you know, Russian car production, the British telephone industry. It was of no use to man or beast. What privatisation meant to me, and I think that, that, that Maggie wanted to do, was to rip that all apart and recreate it on a totally different basis with a totally different ethos. In the city, though, the traditionalists shook their heads. It couldn't be done. What was the industry's view about it, the bosses of, of BT? Their view was, oh, it's too expensive, we can't do it, let's move very slow. It'll never catch on anyway, which is a standard nationalised industry view of modern technologies. Oh, it'll, it's a fad, it'll never work. The Labour Party's commitment to taking privatised BT back into public ownership is absolutely unshaken and unshakable. The new leader of the Labour Party, Neil Kinnock, sensed an opportunity to score some valuable political points. He pledged to re-nationalise every industry that the Conservatives privatised. You have to bear in mind that in those days, the Labour Party wasn't the clone of Thatcherism that it's become today. The Labour Party in those days was red in tooth and claw. It also had public opinion firmly on its side. Most people simply didn't want privatisation. The British people were fearful and hostile, so there was a, it was a highly controversial policy. All the opinion polls in advance of privatisation showed a large majority against the privatisation. People were profoundly uncomfortable about things that they regarded as theirs. They should not be handed over to spivs and greed merchants in the city. That was the general attitude of the public. Uh, so I think privatisation was always um, up against public opinion. Its popularity was strictly with the people who bought the shares. On the 12th of April 1984, Parliament made it possible for the people of the United Kingdom to own British Telecom shares. That means not just... 51% of BT was put up for sale. Three billion shares. Published in November. Much to the government's relief, applications flooded in. I was delighted by the amount of public interest and support. Uh, we'd gone from an issue which many in the city thought would only be attempted by men in white coats who hadn't really understood the facts of life to a huge popular success. As the thousands of applications flooded in, we realised that this was a great success. But would the city agree? On the morning of the 3rd of December 1984, BT shares were offered for sale at 130 pence each. That night, they closed at 173 pence each. A profit of 30% in one day. They have scrambled for stock uh, and the criticism from Labour was not, it's been a flop, the criticism from Labour was the share price has gone up, you therefore sold it too cheaply. Uh, they don't know how relieved we were to sell it at all. The successful sale of British Telecom raised £3.7 billion for the Treasury. It gave Thatcherites a taste for more. Electricity, gas, airlines. Few national assets were out of bounds. From France to the Philippines, from Jamaica to Japan, 
from Malaysia to Mexico, from Sri Lanka to Singapore. Privatization is on the move. Something new had been born. Its name was popular capitalism. Popular capitalism is nothing less than a crusade to enfranchise the many in the economic life of the nation. We conservatives are returning power to the people. That is the way to one nation, one people. When Mrs. Thatcher came to power in 1979, only 7% of the population owned shares. By 1990, it was 25%. Britain would never be the same again. Having a nation of small shareholders was an important part of our vision because we wanted people to understand capitalism. And, uh, when I was a youngster in the 50s and 60s, we still had the idea that capitalists were uh, people who went around in top hats and fur-collared overcoats uh, and grinding the faces of the poor and, and the workers. And that was the sort of Dickensian image of 19th century capitalism, which was still being taught in schools in, in those days. Well, to finance revenue expenditure, um, you're doing something very dangerous. Um, and I think that's what the Treasury was doing, selling off assets to pay for current expenditure. That's not something that a responsible government does. To my mind, any politician that reduces the power of the state is a hero, not a villain. Um, so standing up and saying, she's selling off the power of the government, people should be clapping. Individuals should be standing in the street cheering and saying, our freedom has been given back to us. The Conservatives were even able to privatise the roof above your head. The biggest privatisation of all was of council houses. Oh, it was absolutely wonderful to, to give the chance of somebody who'd been paying rent all their lives to actually own their own, their own home, their flat or their house was a tremendous change. It, it, it appealed, of course, to the very group in society which she always appealed to. Uh, in old-fashioned terms, the C2 class, the, the English working class, as it were. Mrs. Thatcher has celebrated the sale of the millionth council house with the new owners at Forres in Grampian. Her exclusive house... Right to buy became the motto of the Thatcher revolution. What we did was to create, I suppose, a, a lot of vested interests which would make it very difficult for the Labour Party to get the votes to reverse what we were doing. I mean, that's what council house sales did, because it completely changed the mentality of people, made them property owners, gave them something to conserve. As a result of having things to conserve, they became conservatives. For those left out, life in Britain could be tough. After two terms in office, unemployment showed no sign of falling below the three million mark. Going Thatcherites saw job losses as a byproduct of their economic revolution. But the human cost was high. A lot of people who thought they'd had rather cosy, secure lives suddenly found that they were thrown on the scrap heap. It was, it was emotionally very difficult for many of them. Those who got left behind remained bewildered and hurt and troubled and became the dependents that they had believed in the past that they would never be. And they hated that. Unemployment hit hardest in Britain's industrial heartlands. In circles, it's a very, very bad in Teesside alone, 50,000 jobs had been lost under Mrs. Thatcher. Here, unemployment reached 20%. Because so many of the jobs do require more skill. I haven't got no skill. <laughs> what? No, but we can train you to yeah, have some. But you won't give me the money while I am training. The disenchanted did have one way to strike back. 
the trade unions still wielded real political clout. But Mrs. Thatcher decided she wouldn't be held to ransom. It's for too long the trade unions had run this country. We all got used to the sight of the trade union barons coming out of the door of Number 10 Downing Street, having told the Prime Minister of the day what he could and couldn't do to run the country. She was determined to put an end to that. Well, Margaret Thatcher hated trade unions. She couldn't see any worthwhile purpose for them. They'd overthrown a previous Tory government. They'd undermined the previous Labour government. I think if she could have abolished the trade unions, she probably would have done so. Trade unionism was nowhere stronger than in the pits. For most miners, Thatcherism was a destructive force. Twenty uneconomic pits were singled out for closure. 20,000 jobs would be lost. Arthur Scargill, the leader of the National Union of Mine Workers, urged his members out on strike. What began as an industrial dispute would spiral into a titanic political struggle, an ideological clash that would determine the survival of Thatcherism itself. I do think that quite rapidly it became the most crucial argument there was. Were the unions going to win the battle, in which case the, the state simply became subservient to the trade union movement, or was the state going to win, um, in which case the unions would have to go back and behave the same as every other ordinary person? Who governs? Is it the democratically elected government that governs, or is it the trade union bosses? And this had to be settled. The miners had forced the government's hand three times in the previous decade. In 1972 and 74, Ted Heath gave in to their wage demands. And in 1981, Mrs Thatcher shied away from the fight. Margaret Thatcher had very, very quickly backpedalled, and she was quite right uh, at that time, because no preparation of any kind had been put in place for weathering a strike. This time, Mrs Thatcher was determined to be ready. 50 million tonnes of coal were stockpiled to prevent blackouts. We were ready. Oh, my God, were we ready. You could not see the tops of the cooling towers for the mountains of coal. I could see five coal power stations from my back garden, and I could see how much coal was there. We were ready. Back in London, others were less confident of victory. I had my most difficult policy unit meeting when we were on the eve of that strike, and we spent most of the day arguing it over in, in policy unit. Should we do it? Could we do it? What would happen if we did it? And more importantly, what would happen if we didn't? And we did come to the conclusion uh, that it was now or never. It was one of the most momentous decisions ever made by a British government. Especially since public sympathy was with the miners. The NUM's arguments are always presented in a fantastically emotionally compelling way. Starving miners, soup kitchens, um, going underground with canaries to see whether there's gas there or not, risking their lives on a daily basis. A group of men rather like, you know, the chaps in the trenches all fighting alongside each other. Very strong emotional appeal. Taking on the miners was Mrs Thatcher's biggest political gamble so far. You know, it was a huge gamble to take, in the same way as taking the decision to go to war in the Falklands was a huge political gamble. Uh, that was uh, her mettle, though. She was not going to be uh, cowed, ultimately. I think Margaret Thatcher had no doubt at all that Arthur Scargill was General Galtieri. He was the next great enemy. And she prepared for it very carefully. She knew what she was doing. She wanted to be emphatic. She wanted to set a, 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 a symbol, a signal to the nation that this was not going to be tolerated. Um, she wanted Scargill crushed. In March 1984, 
the strike began. The miners answer the call to strike, but there's fighting on a picket line. But even from the start, the NUM was split. Many miners simply didn't want to join the strike. My coal miners talked about this a lot to me, quietly and private, round a, a pint in the miners' welfare. And one of them said to me, what's all this about rolling back tides of Thatcherism, Edwina? We voted for tides of Thatcherism, that's why you're here. And we talked about what to do. It seemed to me that the best thing faced with the issues that Scargill was, was putting to them was to do something it never had to do before and have a vote. And so the South Derbyshire mine workers did vote and they voted overwhelmingly, over 80%, to stay at work. They did not want to be part of the charge of the Light Brigade, they wanted to be on the winning side. Police and miners came face to face at pits across Britain. Emotions often ran high. The worst violence was seen at the Orgreave Coke Works in Yorkshire. The Battle of Orgreave became the defining image of the struggle. We had sort of revolutionary mayhem on the streets. If you look back at the film footage of, uh, of those times, you'd think you were uh, back in Berlin in the 1920s or uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg in 1917. I must tell you, that what we've got is an attempt to substitute the rule of the mob for the rule of law. And it must not succeed. What the minor strike showed was the extraordinary willpower of Margaret. And there were lots of people during that minor strike saying, you must settle, you must settle. Uh, can't you find a way to settle? But she said no. With Mrs Thatcher, there was never any question of seeing both sides of the question. There was only one side. That was the side she believed in, and she was going to implement it. And that was her great strength. Oh, you couldn't have won this strike without Margaret. Margaret was the rock on which the whole thing was based. And there is an enormous atmosphere at the time of the strike of a sort of St George mentality. We were fighting the dragon, and we were determined to kill it. On the 3rd of March, 1985, after a year-long struggle, the miners marched back to work. Trade union power had been defeated by Mrs Thatcher's will. If it hadn't been the miners, it would have been somebody else. But Mr Scargill set himself up as the Aunt Sally, and Margaret Thatcher took extremely careful aim and was determined that once he was down, he was going to stay down. And with him, the whole union project. We want Scargill! We want Scargill! We want Scargill! We want Scargill! I just want to say this. You're the leader. That we have been involved in the greatest industrial struggle ever seen. It's not done! The strike itself We'll be over on Tuesday and there'll be a discipline vote. No! Looking back, it's difficult to see what one could have done differently, because if the government had given in, then I think that would have been the effective end of the government, just as um, giving in to unions or not managing unions well had been the end of the two previous governments, the Callaghan government and the Heath government. But the miners were not the only casualties. The government was also wounded. Mrs Thatcher's own popularity tumbled in the polls. Her aura of invulnerability was punctured and her seemingly magic hold over the electorate shaken. I mean, she was unpopular because she was perceived as being a, a, a partisan faction leader who was splitting the country, 
who was uh, tearing apart settled communities. Uh, she was seen as being a brittle, um, one-sided politician, and people didn't like that at all. Riots broke out in Birmingham, London and Liverpool. It seemed that far from realising the dream of one nation, one people, Thatcherism had divided Britain into haves and have-nots. People say that whatever she achieved, it came at great human cost. Well, yes, of course, because politics isn't about taking easy decisions. Making revolutions isn't about making life comfortable for people. There were people, there were bound to be people who were hurt along the way. Despite the human cost, there was no turning back. There has been the odd report recently that Thatcherism has run its course and is on its way out. As an informed source, <laughs> close to Downing Street, I have to report that those reports are eyewash. Margaret Thatcher didn't have a lot of time for colleagues who told her that she'd done all that she could possibly hope to achieve and that now was the time for consolidation, now was the time to slow down, now, now was the time to give a lot of ground to critics. And yet some Thatcherites thought the revolution was not going fast enough. The No Turning Back group, a dining club for right-wing MPs, met once a month here at the Institute of Economic Affairs. We, as the intellectual praetorian guard of the Thatcherite wave, we would um, develop ideas around the table. We would have somebody come along and talk to us, to get the discussion going, you know, from Prime Minister downward. The No Turning Back group wanted to push Thatcherism to the extreme, to privatise the two sacred cows of the nation-state, education and health. We wanted to split up this vast monolith which uh, Nye Bevan had created in the late 1940s and the Tories had never done anything seriously to reform in the intervening 40 or 50 years. Uh, and we wanted that split up into individual um, freestanding hospitals w which you know, had their own cost centres and profit centres and they'd be competing against one another. Mrs. Thatcher could not afford to get carried away by such ideas. She always had to keep one eye on the electorate. Mrs. Thatcher was a radical, but she was a pragmatic radical. She wouldn't pursue wild-eyed ideas which she knew would not have been acceptable to the British people at that time. They could be led so far, but they couldn't be pushed into extreme positions. M Margaret would have recognised with that shrewdness, that tough shrewdness that she had, that any attempt to dismantle the NHS would have been met with total defeat at the polls and a reversal by the next government. So she wasn't going to do that. In she goes, a terrific crowd of people cheering away, policemen barring our entry. Margaret Thatcher's political instincts proved correct. In 1987, she won a third term in office. A victory rested on populist Thatcherite policies. Home ownership, share culture, individual opportunity. These were the pillars of electoral success. Well, there was a lot of work to be done. Uh, you know, one, one had a feeling in being and living in that time that it was a turbulent time. It was very exciting. Things were always happening. Things were moving forward. Things were changing. And people were responding. Margaret Thatcher soaked up what the public felt about many issues. Above all, she soaked up what she called my people thought, the aspiring middle classes. She really seemed to know in her bones what it was that they wanted, how they wanted to see the country run. Buoyed up by her success, Mrs Thatcher would make the biggest blunder of her career. 
she backed a policy that would lead to her own downfall. We all know that the rate system isn't at all fair. Unfair! Unfair. That's why we're going to get rid of it. Every homeowner in the land paid the rates, a property tax used to fund local government services. Mrs Thatcher believed the system was unfair and unconservative. In Thatcher land, everybody would have to pay. We set up a great committee to examine all the alternatives, which we did. And the idea was to find a tax which local authorities could, could issue and be responsible for and spend in their own way. And we came up with the idea of a poll tax. The poll tax, or community charge, was intended to relieve the burden on the homeowning class. It was a fixed fee, paid by all adults, whether homeowners or not. She did regard, and rightly, domestic rating as being unfair to, quote, our people, unquote, um, some of the lower middle class homeowners who voted conservative. Uh, so she was determined to do what she could um, in order to alleviate the burden on them. The new system is fair. Fair because everyone pays their bit. Fair because those that can't afford it get help. It's called the community charge. The new tax may have sounded fair in theory, but in practice, it was anything but. It was a completely crazy policy. I mean, the idea that everyone has to pay exactly the same in an area for local services, irrespective of how much they're using it, irrespective of their income, irrespective of the size of their house or their wealth, was inherently unfair. I don't think she gave sufficient attention to the detailed impact of what was proposed. And I think she also had, by that stage, um, an, a belief in her almost magic powers to get people to go along with her. In early 1990, thousands took to the streets. You don't have to take this crime. You don't have to sit back and relax. For them, the poll tax penalised the poor and the needy. That was the one mistake Margaret made was she forgot it was a tax. Um, she was a tax cutter and she introduced a new tax. People just couldn't understand that. An elderly couple were suddenly find they were having to pay £700, whereas the rates on their property might have only been 200 And So it was, you know, it was, the poll tax was never intended to do that, ever, ever intended to do that. To have constituency surgeries in which you have little old ladies breaking down in tears um, is, first of all, um, extremely uh, unattractive, and secondly, gives you a pretty clear idea of how large the writing is on the wall. Have you worked out how much the poll tax is going to be yet, Peter? The Tory party's own research found seven out of ten people would be worse off. So, what does it add up to? Well, it adds up to very bad news for Mrs Vigood of One the Avenue, Surrey. She said, you're going to get poll tax whether you like it or not. She said that to a government, she said that to a cabinet, she said that ultimately to the people. And at the end of the day, they said no. Once again, riots broke out in Britain's cities. Come on, move away. Move on. Hold it on, move on. This time, Mrs. Thatcher had pushed the British public to breaking point. It embodied everything that people disliked about Thatcher. She didn't care about the poor seemed to be all that um, Thatcherism was, 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 was about rolled up into this one ball called poll tax. The television pictures of the police on 
horseback. The horses looking as if they were in war armor with blinkers rearing up, uh, people fleeing from their pounding hooves, was reminiscent of, of Waterloo, and it was a pretty horrible experience to be watching it, and I've no doubt it was pretty horrible to be there. It was plainly going to be political death. I mean, it sank me below the waterline. I had to implement the bloody thing. The poll tax inflicted a critical blow to Mrs. Thatcher's authority. Thatcherism had simply been driven too far, too fast. She never was completely in control of this tiger that she'd released from the cage, but it was her tiger, and she had released it from the cage. And I always felt that at that end, that final golden period, as it's often called, she was riding her own tiger um, to eventual doom. Under fire from press and party, Mrs. Thatcher retreated into her bunker. What happens to all leaders in power is the longer they go on, the more isolated they get, the more cut off from their roots. A Maggie Thatcher has been in power for longer than any other previous prime minister. The cocoon eventually got much thicker, and the woman who had started off her career in Downing Street desperately wanting ideas, new ideas, and, and to discuss those ideas with people, became a, a much older woman in a great hurry who didn't want to waste time, and she would refer to it as wasting time on argument anymore. She wanted to get on with it in, in her own terms. By now, Thatcherism had become less about radical ideas and more about Mrs. Thatcher's domineering personality. There was one wonderful cartoon. Margaret by Cummings showing the cabinet meeting and all the places were filled by Margaret with the different titles in front of her. <laughs> the cartoon was saying that Margaret was the dominant person of her, of her government and she could do all the jobs uh, and that's how she was often seen. The two most influential members of Mrs Thatcher's team were Foreign Secretary Geoffrey Howe and Chancellor Nigel Lawson. Her authority in Cabinet relied on their support. Both had been true believers since the beginning, but over time they felt increasingly sidelined. Whereas at the beginning, uh, she was very much the captain of her team, and she felt that she needed the team, even though the team obviously needed her as a captain, but she needed the team. This became less and less the case as time went by. She did begin to feel completely self-sufficient. The relationship between Chancellor and Prime Minister soured. At the heart of their disagreement, the future economic direction of Thatcherism. The world went into recession and the British economy nosedived. Inflation soared towards double figures. Interest rates hit 12%. Lawson proposed a solution. Sterling would join the European exchange rate mechanism. This went against a fundamental tenet of Thatcherism that the money market, and not governments, should decide the exchange rate. Mrs Thatcher was utterly opposed. There was a genuine disagreement. Lawson believed um, in, a, in, a, in an economic structure that included the ERM that was tied up with the euro, and she didn't, uh, and they completely disagreed. And she would say, look at what it says on the door of number 10, first Lord of the Treasury, I run the economy, not you. Um, and they hated that, absolutely loathed it. I felt I was being completely undermined, and it led to huge confusion in the financial markets. I felt that I had no option but to resign, which I did, with a heavy heart. Uh, nobody resigns from that sort of job very lightly, uh, but uh, I felt I had to. That the Chancellor Nigel Lawson has resigned. Time ago, it was confirmed from the Chancellor's office. Downing Street tonight, Mrs. Thatcher faces the biggest political crisis of her ten years in power. Nigel Lawson was one of her strongest, most articulate and intellectually strong supporters. Um, and when he tried to resign, she tried just to sort of tell him, don't to be so silly, as it were. You know, how can you possibly resign? And it, I think it came as a real surprise to her that he was Hi, determined to go. Bye, Graham. 
Alienating one key minister was foolish. Losing another would prove fatal. Again, the issue involved Europe. It was a disastrous issue for us. Europe was rather like the Bermuda Triangle for the Conservative Party. Politicians sailed into it and disappeared from sight. For Mrs Thatcher and her supporters, Europe was about bossiness and bureaucracy, running counter to her vision of a proud and independent Britain. She was opposed to almost everything European for one simple reason, British sovereignty. She really firmly believes in the nation state. She believes that Britain is an individual country that should make its own laws, should run its own society, and the only reason to be part of the European Union is to ensure peace in Europe. That's what it was set up for. That's what she believes it for. She was never in favor of, of economic union. She was never in favor of any of those things. Ted Heath had taken the country in. Perhaps Mrs. Thatcher's instinct was to take the country out. When she started being anti-Europe, and there were whispers that we should pull out, that we should somehow be an isolated island on the edge of Europe, that we should maintain this battle mentality, this beleaguered little island mentality. Quite a lot of us were saying, no, 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 we're not having that. Soon the whispers became a roar. The president of the commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community. He wanted the commission to be the executive and he wanted the council of ministers to be the Senate. No, no, no. She'd become like a political Chernobyl, from whom all of her ministers were desperately trying to distance themselves. And it sort of broke my heart because there was a woman that I had loved, um, going a long way to destroying herself. And for another former ally, Geoffrey Howe, the love affair was also over. He resigned from cabinet after 12 years by her side. By my right honourable friend, who seems, who seems sometimes to look out upon a continent that is positively teeming with ill-intentioned people, scheming, in her words, to extinguish democracy. I sat next to him when he made his resignation speech because he'd asked me if I would. And I'm very happy to do that. But I was astonished at the uh, virulence of his attack on Margaret Thatcher. It was quite un jeffrey -ish. It's rather like sending your opening batsman to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. <laughs> I was sitting next to Margaret on the front bench when Geoffrey Howe made his devastating speech. It was an assassination speech. And uh, when she, uh, he'd finished, I remember her turning to me and she said, I never thought he'd do it. I've done what I believe to be right. The time has come for others to consider their own response to the tragic conflict of loyalties with which I have myself wrestled for perhaps too long. Yeah. The atmosphere was just amazing. The air flickered with electricity. It was dangerous. Whichever way you moved, you were going to get burned. If we stayed with Margaret and backed her, we are going to lose an election and the whole Thatcherite revolution would be dismantled. But if we wanted the revolution to be consolidated, she had become its main obstacle. And she had to go. When the leadership contest was declared, Mrs. Thatcher reacted with wounded pride. I remember asking her several times, would you go and talk to backbenchers? And she said, look, Kenneth, I've won three elections. I made our party great again, our country great again. Do I really have to do that? Can't they support me? Just a little bit of cosseting, a, a bit of attention can often work wonders. A phone call, um, uh, an invitation to have a late night whiskey, uh, that sort of thing, uh, could make all the difference without having an overt campaign as though your life depended upon it. That very weekend, a new blockbuster drama series began on BBC TV. House of Cards traced the rise and fall of a great Conservative leader. House of Cards opened up with Francis Urquhart, 
the wonderful Ian Richardson looking at a silver framed photograph of Maggie Thatcher saying nothing lasts forever and putting it face down. And John Major told me afterwards how in the middle of the leadership campaign every Sunday night at nine o'clock when House of Cards went out that the whole of his leadership team would stop doing whatever it is they were doing and they would all gather around the television to find out what happened next <laughs> because people had this extraordinary idea that somehow we were able to foresee the future. And indeed they could. Mrs Thatcher won the first round of the leadership ballot but she failed to achieve the two-thirds majority required to win outright. The margin was four. Five votes would have done it. And then the course of the next few years would have been very different. Only the most ardent Thatcherite stuck by the Prime Minister to the bitter end. I'd gone over to number 10 um, about 11 o'clock, half past 10, 11 o'clock, I suppose. We were there to bolster her resolve because we'd heard that she was thinking of throwing in the towel. We raced to number 10 to try and dissuade her from, from standing down um, uh, and to, to carry on the fight. We got there and met a very disillusioned woman. It was one of the saddest sights that I can ever recall seeing when I went into that room. Um, she had all the stuffing knocked out of her and she was totally deflated. I'd never ever seen her like that before or, or indeed since. We made uh, a few attempts uh, at persuading her to stay on. They really fell on deaf ears. Uh, so I knew that was it. Thatcherism was all over. On Wednesday, 28th of November 1990, Mrs. Thatcher left Downing Street for the final time. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. I was fantastically depressed. Um, the, the excitement of working with her was extraordinary. Uh, you never knew what was going to happen day from day. Um, and suddenly the whole game was over. I would bet you anything you like that most of her own members of Parliament that day were saying to themselves, what on earth have we done? Why have we got rid of this woman? When she went, um, it was kind of, you just felt people were walking on air. I mean, it was just different. She'd gone. She was terrific. She gave us the medicine. We took the medicine. It was painful. It was awful. But she's gone. Thank God. Although the Tory party held on to power for seven more years, it was critically wounded. The party was traumatized by the political assassination of its most charismatic leader since Churchill. The Conservatives took to infighting and lost their political direction. The very people who withheld their support from her on grounds that you couldn't win a subsequent election with her, were ultimately responsible for sending the Conservative Party into the wilderness for, electorally speaking, for 15 or 20 years. And the Tory party has suffered the repercussions ever since. Some say the real beneficiaries of Thatcherism have been new Labour, revamped and repackaged under Tony Blair. You've got to remember that Tony Blair admired Thatcher to bits. When he became Prime Minister, she was the first person he invited to Downing Street, two weeks after becoming there, before he invited any Labour grandee, before he invented Michael Foote, Neil Kinnock, anyone. He invited Margaret Thatcher to Downing Street. She admires him, he admires her. They are birds of the same feather. Such nations aren't built by dreamers. They rise by the patient courage of the changemaker. And that's what we've been in New Labour, changemakers. And that is how we must stay. To Maggie's admirers, it's not just about style. They say it's also about substance. Tony Blair looked at what made Labour unelectable. And it was clause four, it was the whole of state ownership, it was dependence on the trade unions. He ditched all that. I think that Tony Blair has reaped the benefits of Thatcherism because he has not really reversed anything. He hasn't renationalized anything. He hasn't fundamentally changed the trade union legislation. It's all accepted. 
Though Thatcherites may see their reflection on both sides of the commons, New Labour and the lady herself are not so sure. I suspect that Maggie Thatcher in her, <laughs> her less kind moments would regard it as being a, uh, an obscenity uh, to compare Thatcherism with Tony Blair. Notice, not Blairism, there is no such thing as Blairism. Blairites might disagree, but Thatcherites now believe their policies define the centre ground. All the major things that we fought for in the 1980s are now accepted as um, sensible policies by our political opponents. I mean, that is a revolution in politics, if ever there was one. Mrs Thatcher may be long out of Downing Street, but her shadow still falls long over the British political landscape. Andy and Curtis's controversial drama about the Falklands conflict is here on BBC Four at nine on Wednesday, all part of the Thatcher years season. And if all this nostalgia is making you a bit blue, we've got just the thing for you. The Cult of Howard's Way is next. <laughs>